Bernie Roth. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you just published a book, The Achievement Habit. You have a really interesting background because you're a professor at the Hasso Planter Institute of Design at Stanford University. It's the D School. For, for our listeners who aren't familiar with design theory and like what, I mean, what do you teach students at the D School and what do people who specialize in design go on to do later on? Yeah, well, it's a little de- deceiving the name. So the thing to understand is we don't really teach professional designers at all, although some professional designers do work here. What we're doing is something called design thinking, which is a kind of broad problem solving methodology that evolved from people who originally did what you think designers do, which is they worry about artifacts, they worry about different things in the world. And we're interested not only in things, but also in uh, people and organizations and behavior. We're interested in all sorts of problems. And we find that these methodologies, which are a little bit different than the normal problem-solving methodologies, are very effective especially the whole idea of being human-centered and being concerned with the people you're working for is a kind of new twist on on an old thing, which is getting stuff done in the world. So we give the students an experience that way. My institute is not really a, a department, so we can't admit anyone to Stanford and we can't give degrees, but we do give courses. And last year, for or this, this year, for example, we're giving 70 courses and we have over a thousand Stanford students taking them. And they're mainly uh, graduate students, master's and PhD students in all the departments in the university. And when they get done, they go back to doing what they were doing. You know, before Enlightenment, they hewed wood, and after Enlightenment, they hewed wood also. So it's mainly just giving them extra tools in their life. Now, some flip. A few become just so enamored by what they've gotten in the new method that they become the professional so-called design thinkers. But basically think of it in terms of a learning by doing methodology that's useful in almost any walk of life. Right. So it could be designing a product or designing a system that humans use that makes yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It could design. It, it's not tied to a physical product. Although it might include that, but in general, it could be the way a hospital works. It could be the way your life works. <laughs> it could be the way your organization functions to accomplish something. It could be the way the government hires people. It could be the way you give Social Security benefits to people. It's, it's almost any issue dealing with people uh, that we are interested in. Well, so for a big picture overview, we don't have to get in the details, but I mean, what is the process of design thinking? Like what is, what, what goes on when you're, when you're looking at a problem and how you solve that? Yeah, well, the, the process itself is not that unique. It's more a set of mindsets that go with it. So first, the, the process, we there's not a process, there are many processes. And the thing is, it's not very linear, but for purposes of teaching and explaining, we thought we have a process that we advertise, although not everyone uses it, of course. And that is, if you get if you get an issue, first of all, get acquainted with what the problem is, which seems, um, of course, you have to do that. Get as much information as you can, and then define what the real problem is. We call that a point of view. And then once you get that, you ideate and you test and you uh, produce a solution. Well, almost everyone does that one way or another, whether they call it design thinking or not, if you're problem solving. So really what the difference is that we're much more human-centered than most problem solvers are. Most people, when they solve problems, just talk to others, other professionals. They don't really talk to the people they're actually doing the thing for. And I can give you some good examples of that later. We also have what's called a bias towards action. We don't overthink and overplan. In fact, we tend to avoid planning. Uh, We just learn by doing. So that's something which you're going to make mistakes. You know, if you just do something without thinking about it, you're surely going to at some point make some mistakes. And our, our whole mindset is to learn from your mistakes. And that may be a better and faster way to learn than just sitting around thinking, hoping you're going to get it perfect the first time. So we have what's called the bias towards action. We have the human centeredness I mentioned. We have the notion of radical collaboration, which is to involve many more voices than are usually involved in getting a job done. So all our 
classes, which are project-based classes, are very interdisciplinary. So it's not unusual for us to have a team of four where one person is in the graduate school of business, one person may be in medicine or law, one person is in engineering, one person is in the humanities. And those four people are working on the same issue. So we get different perspectives and it's very enriching. So we have this whole idea of radical collaboration. We don't let any one course be taught by just one person. So I myself, even though I'm you know, one of the originators cannot go into a classroom just by myself. I have to have some other people in there uh, also helping re- lead the class. So we, we have this whole idea of multiple voices and then there are a few other things we do, but that's the whole idea is to just have an action-based approach to problem solving where you learn by doing and you learn from what happens and you don't worry about making a mistake because you know you can correct it and maybe it's the best thing that happens to you during the process. Okay, and so what you've done in the achievement habit is you've you've taken this design thinking and apply it, help people apply it to the most human of activities is designing your life, right? In in a way that's yeah. so yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny because when I started to do that, I thought I'd get a lot of pushback from the people in the business because one of the, the one of our mantras is design for someone else, don't design for yourself. So, but actually, it's been very well accepted by the people, and now there are those who actually talk about designing your life. My book is not really a design your life book. It's the design your everyday thing. People who more talk about design your life, they're talking about future planning and things of that nature. Uh, my belief is you can't really plan. My Everything that happened in my life that's great happened sort of by happenstance. You know, it was an accident, it was a phone call, it was meeting someone. It wasn't something I could have planned out at all. So I'm a firm believer in a sort of getting your act together day to day and having a decent life as you go along and the long run will take care of itself if you, if the short term is, is, is moving correctly. I, I was going to say, so, you know, the book's called Achievement Habit. So with that, what, with what you just said, what is it that you mean by achievement? Well, I do not mean being queen or king of the universe. <laughs> and, what, and I actually have a friend said to me, Bernie, I would never buy a book with achievement in the title. <laughs> but really what I mean about it is to have a good life. And I, I say, uh, you know, it, you have the ultimate achievement is when you if when you die and your friends eulogize you, they don't have to lie, and if they can tell the truth about you uh, and be proud of it, uh, you, that's a good measure of it. But it's really the whole idea of being a decent human being and uh, feeling comfortable about your life, being comfortable about it, being in your skin, and having the people around you feel good about you, and being part of a functioning uh, society. So uh, I think that's what an achievement. This that's achieving a good life to me. So, as I was, you know, reading about what design thinkers do, in a lot of ways, you guys are meaning makers. You're trying to create a system or a product that, when a, a human interacts with it, it makes sense to them. Right? They know how. They intuitively know how to use it. It, it provides some structure. But what's interesting, you talk about one of the things that design thinkers do is they suspend all sense of meaning to create more meaning, right? So what, what's going on there? Why is it important for designers to suspend all you know, sense of meaning so they can create more effective systems? Well, I, I would say it a little bit differently. I, I think the first thing is to realize you give everything in your life its meaning, basically. Nothing has an intrinsic meaning that you haven't given it. And because of that, you're sort of a powerful person. You're sort of godlike, if I might say, because you're giving everything in your life its meaning. So that's both wonderful and it's a little dangerous because you might give it a, a meaning which is sort of destructive in terms of getting the problem solved or getting what you want to do handled. So at that point, you'd have to, you can reframe it and give it a slightly different meaning. So the whole idea is to be flexible and to realize that not everything means exactly what you think it means in your life. And you can use it in different ways and you can do different things and you can see the same situation from many different viewpoints. And that's a very powerful thing because it gets you unstuck if you're just in a uh, 
you know, if you're stuck in this pigeonhole, you know, it can get you into trouble. But I think in general, I, I find that's a very powerful notion for me. You know, people think if, if, you, if everything doesn't have a set meaning, that's terrible, it's nihilistic. I actually see it as very powerful. I see it, it empowers me because I can choose the meaning of, of all the stuff that happens in my life. So, you know, this interview, I can make it the best thing in my life that ever happened or the worst thing in my life that ever happened. (laughs) (laughs) And we might both come up with different meanings for it. I don't know. But, you know, you get to play these things all out. And it's uh, it's so interesting, you know. So if you, as an example, if you make a mistake, if if something terrible happens, you can become suicidal about it. Or you can say, wow, I really learned. I'm never going to do that again. That was really exciting. You know, that's such a valuable experience I got out of it. So, you know, as I say, it, it's, it's, I don't want to be extreme about it, but it's really important to realize that. And, in fact, people who do uh, great inventions and things, I mean, there's almost nothing new in the world. So people who make great inventions, they just combine things in different ways. So in a way, they're just seeing it. They're seeing the same thing in a different way that others haven't seen it. And that leads to the magic of great accomplishments and and, and getting things done that uh, you feel proud of. So that's what I mean by uh, giving things its meaning. And I find it a very positive uh, aspect of life. Right. I can see how they can in, in, increase creativity because I've, I've read studies where they'll do those things where they'll get a bunch of adults and then give them just random objects and they have to solve a problem. So like they'll have a hammer, a knife, et cetera. And the adults, they just tend to like think of a hammer like, well, you just hammer a nail with it. That's what you do with it. But when they do this to kids, kids don't have that. So they think, oh, a hammer could also be a weight. It could be, so yeah, by not having, like by not looking at this typical pigeonholed meaning of something, it allows you to get create more creative with things. Exactly. Yes. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And it's, it's not only for physical objects, it's of course, behavioral and right. relationships with other people and our families. And, you know, it's, it's all over the place to realize that. Yeah, I mean, I can see that when you were describing applying it to your life, it seemed very like a, a very stoic approach. Like the Stoics were all about it's not the thing itself that's causing you harm; it's how you're thinking about the thing that's causing yes. you harm. Sure, yes, definitely. So I've encountered whenever I'm designing something, whether it's a plan for vacation or planning my day, or if it's some big project, there's a tendency that I typically fall into, and I think a lot of people do too, is you, you focus on the things that prevent you from achieving your end. I'm curious, you know, with your experience, why do you think it's our default that humans go to? Like, why do you always think about the problems that prevent us from getting to our end goal? I think humans are basically problem solvers. I mean, that's somewhere in our DNA. And if you're not a problem solver, you wouldn't live long on the earth. So everyone solves hundreds of problems each every day, you know, just uh, getting connected to make the call, my getting into the office, my getting dressed, my eating, you know, this is, this, and most of them we do kind of automatically. We don't even think about them. We've learned how to do them. Although as a child, you know, you don't need so automatically you have to learn how to eat not get food all over the floor and you have to learn how to get dressed so we've learned all these things and and we've solved those problems and then we as we move on we get problems which we haven't solved before and we tend to get stuck sometimes in those things and those are the things that sort of occupy us it's sort of what you don't have is always more important than what you have so (laughs) people tend to look at the things that aren't working rather than things that are working so i think that's part of the human condition and i think it's not a bad one it's just a matter of how you approach it and what you do with the frustration of being thwarted for a moment and you know that is that's the opportunity usually i I have a, a friend who uh, he's an Olympic medal winner. He's done a lot of things, and he's he started many companies. and And he says to me all the time, you know, every time I've started a company in general, I've had some big obstacle, and in getting around that obstacle, that was the magic. If I hadn't encountered the obstacle, I would have done this prosaic thing, and then I I just was so thwarted. I just was blocked and I found this magic way around it and that made the thing really much better than it would have been to begin with. So being blocked is not a bad thing. It's just a state of, of 
part of the process of solving problems. And if not, you don't even notice it. I mean, if it just goes automatically, which most of our life do, and most people who function pretty well, their life just flows. They don't worry about problems during the day. At night, they may lose sleep over stuff, but during the day, they just have sort of mastery in what they're doing. So it's a kind of complex uh, question you're asking, but I would say, yeah, uh, it's okay to get frustrated, and the way the, the magic is to figure out ways around it and and not let it beat you down and uh, deter you from moving forward. And you you also make the bold claim in the book that oftentimes when we give reasons why something can't be done, you know, they're basically excuses, right? There really aren't reasons. Those are just excuses. There's always a solution there if you think creatively. Yeah. So, so what I claim is that there's no single reason for any human behavior. But if someone asks you what the reason is or you're the kind of person who needs a reason, you'll, of course, do that. It's, it's so funny. I just had this thing with my wife. We have, she has some cousins in France, and they, we don't have much contact with them, but they were nice enough to send us an email inviting us to a, a daughter's wedding, and we, we're not going to go. And I... My wife says, well, what should I say? I said, well, just say thanks for the invitation. Sorry, we can't make it. She says, no, no, i got to give them a reason. <laughs> should I tell them because you're working or because we're going to Corsica? Or because... I said, no, don't, you don't give them. Just say what you're doing. And it's so funny. We're so different in that way. But it's really true. Reasons are – I come to the statement that the radical statement is reasons are both, basically. They're, they're, because – there's no one reason for anything, you know. You asked me to be on this podcast. If you said to me, why did you say yes? I said, because you, why, why, why are you on the podcast? I said, because you invited me. But it's not, that, it's not that simple because a lot of people invited me on podcasts. It has to do with a lot of things in my life. And why did, if I ask you, why did you invite me? You'll say, well, I liked your book. But it's also not that simple because you've liked a lot of books in your life, I'm sure. Right, right. So we're very complicated people, and a lot of stuff goes on that makes us – do the behavior we do. Most of the time, we just act automatically. There have been tests. Uh, they put people in MRI machines, have them do a task, and ask them why they've done the task. And what happens is the part of the brain that deals with the actual physical doing fires long before the part of the brain that deals with the reason. So what, essentially, we, we, we're on automatic. We do stuff, and then we make up reasons for doing it if someone asks us. And that's in order to be a reasonable person. So if you ask me a reason, I don't give you a reason. I'm not a reasonable person. So the only thing that reasons are good for is to seem to be a reasonable person. The bad thing is they're mainly excuses. They're often a, a ways for us to not to live up to what we want to do. So, I mean, I don't care if a reason is a bullshit or not. What I do care about is that it prevents you from doing what you want to do because you're just relying on the reason. I, I, in the book, I give this example, which is where I got the epiphany. I was on the board of directors of a company up in Berkeley, which is nominally about an hour away from Stanford. And I was invariably late. Every, every board of directors meeting, I was late. And I'd come in there and I'd blame the traffic on the highway. And it is true there was traffic on the highway. But in fact, I was being abusive to these people because I was keeping them waiting. They had, and I got this realization that I should either quit the board or give it more valence in my life and get there on time. And what it meant was just leaving more time in the trip. It's as simple as that. But before I did that, I always, you know, I did a few things extra before I left. And I got to my car just in time that if there was no traffic, I would get there. And, of course, there was always traffic. So I blamed the traffic. But, of course, the real many different things. And one was how I held that. My membership, my, my sense of belonging, uh, my sense of obligation, and it totally changed my life to someone who's now totally on time for everything. Because if I make an obligation, I, I, I honor it. And it's just a matter of giving it enough priority in your life. So, you know, people who are late all the time, it's just they're not giving the thing that they're supposed to be at any priority. It's insulting to the people they're going to. So 
it's, it's that kind of a thing. If you realize that the reasons are not helpful at all, and they're often destructive. Another example I love is I get requests from around the world to come to Stanford to do a PhD from China, Pakistan, Iran, and so on. And some of these requests are quite lengthy, and they've researched me and all that. And I feel bad, bad not answering. So I would give them excuses. You know, I'm sorry I can't take you because I don't have any money. I'm sorry I can't take you because I'm going on sabbatical. And whenever I gave them a reason, they push back with, well, if you don't have money, I have a rich uncle. If you're going on sabbatical, I can wait a year. And the conversation would go back and forth until I just truncated because of frustration. Nowadays that I have this enlightenment, I just say, sorry, I can't help you. Good luck. And what happens is about 90% of the time I get back an email, thank you, professor, for answering my email. That's the end of the story. <laughs> if I don't give them a reason, they have nothing to push back against. It's as simple as that. Just say what you do, say what you don't do. Don't worry about the reasons. No one needs the reasons, and they're very destructive to you. So one of the things you talk about, you know, we were talking about getting stuck in a problem. And I love this one, this, this one solution you gave because it's changed the way I'm looking at things is that oftentimes the problem we think is the problem isn't really the problem. And there's, we can often go to a higher level to really find out what the problem is. Can you walk us through what that get to a higher level method is and how that can help people get unstuck? Sure. Oh, well, the way to get to what, what I call a higher level, which is just a name for reframing the problem to something more functional, is ask yourself what it would do if you solved the problem. So you're stuck with something and you think you have to do something and then ask yourself what it would do for you if you solved it. And when you do that, that gives you a new problem. And I'll give you an example. The one I love, the funniest one, is I was working with a group of Stanford alumni, and this woman's problem was that her boyfriend snored at night, and they'd gone to all sorts of medical specialists, and they can't cure or eliminate his snoring. So I asked her, what would it do for you if, my, if your boyfriend stopped snoring? She said, I would be able to get a good night's sleep. So now I say, well, the new problem is how do you get a good night's sleep? Well, when you're getting a good night's sleep, you're opening up the solution space tremendously. One solution might be to get the boyfriend to stop snoring, but there are many others, including change the boyfriend, right? <laughs> or put, put on earplugs or uh, sleep in a different room. So what happens is by reframing it, she's opened up the solution space. And before she was just fixated on this one thing, getting this poor guy to stop snoring. And it's, it's a really interesting example of the kind of thing we do all the time. We, we so fixate on what we think the right answer is, we don't see the big picture as to what it is we want to really accomplish. And even if he stopped snoring, maybe she wouldn't get as much sleep as she thought. So, so it's that kind of idea. But it, that happens to technical problems all the time. It happens in my life many times. It's, it's, it's sort of magic. When you reframe it, you realize, aha, that real problem is, is not the one I've been working on. No, yeah, it's been super powerful. Whenever I get like frustrated or at a sticking point, I'm asked like, "What am I trying to solve here?" And with so, which, as you, as you said, sometimes the answer is, you know, it means like I don't do this thing. Like I don't need to do this thing because <laughs> you think you do, but you really don't. And then you just you delete it or delegate it. And often, even if you solve the the wrong problem, it won't help you. I want another example. Some woman I worked with, she had a, a, she was worried about getting her daughter into a good college. And that, that, that was, she was losing sleep over the issue. And the question is, well, what would it do for you if you got your daughter into a good college? Oh, I could stop worrying about a daughter. Well, the whole <laughs> idea is, is to stop worrying about it. Because even if the daughter got into a good college, she'd worry about who her daughter's sleeping with or what her daughter's majoring in or what she can do when she graduate. You know, the problem is not the daughter of the good college. The problem is the mother's neuroses <laughs> and not being able to handle uncertainty in life and things like that. So it, it, even if you solve the thing, if it's not the right thing, it doesn't help you at all. It, it doesn't handle it. I, I call it, if you solve the right thing, it basically disappears the problem. And that's a much higher state to be in than the one that is uh, just solving it because it can come back and get you, especially if it's the wrong problem, it will still be in your life. So you want to do something which just makes it no longer an issue in your life because you've handled it so well that it's kind of disappears. So as you said earlier, with design thinking, there's a bias towards action. Like I think most people, when they think design, they yeah. think some guy, you know, 
over you know some blueprints drawing something out but you guys are learning by doing but you make the point that oftentimes people when they think they're doing and taking action they really aren't they're just merely trying what is how do you differentiate between trying and doing yeah well first of all you know I, whenever i get to this i get nervous that yoda is going to uh, strike the dead <laughs> But, you know, because of that famous line in Star Wars, there is no try, just do. Uh, but basically, there is a try. In real life, try is fine. And I think trying is just as good as doing. I think the problem is that people conflate the two. They think they're the same thing, and they're not. And they're just two different states. So if you're trying to do something, it might or might not happen. And if you get an obstacle in the way, it will probably stop you, and you won't let get it to happen. If you're doing something, nothing is going to stop you. The obstacle, if you get it, you're going to figure out a way around it, and you're going to actually handle it. And that's the difference. And it's it's okay to try. It could be a lot of fun to try, but it's totally different if you do. I, I have an incident in my book, which is kind of says it all. My wife and I were driving home from San Francisco. I noticed the movie theater, that's sort of plays very special movies and it had a huge line around it and i passed it many times i never saw a line that large around it and it turns out the movie was about a, a music group and the group was going to be there and it was obviously very popular because of this big line so i said to my wife let's go see the movie and she said no no i'm tired i want to go home let's go home we talked back and forth eventually she relented and I said, okay, jump out in front of the theater. You buy the tickets. I'll go find a parking place. I came back 10 minutes later. She's not online. She's just standing in front of the ticket booth. And I said, what happened? She said, they were sold out. I couldn't get, I said, well, why aren't you online? She said, I couldn't get tickets. Did you hear me? They were sold out. And I said, oh, just wait here. <laughs> and I worked my way down the line. I ended up with two tickets and we went. And uh, it was a great example of several things. One is the my wife is always right because it was a terrible show. But the real thing is she was trying. She was trying to accommodate me. And as soon as she got an obstacle, they were sold out. She was frustrated. That was the end. That she's not doing. I was going to do whatever it took. I was going to get two tickets to get us in there. And that's the difference. The fact that they were sold out was irrelevant to me. It in no way slowed me down for a minute. Yeah, I was going to get these tickets, whatever it took to get them. So it's an example of the difference between trying and doing. Now, it doesn't make my wife wrong and it doesn't make me right. It just shows the different kind of actions that you have. I, I, another example I had where I was glad to try, I, I had gotten some money for some research and part of the obligation was to go to Houston for a meeting, or I'm sorry, to, to Dallas for a meeting. And I went to... I, went to San Francisco airport reluctantly to take the flight. And when I got there, it was a miracle. There was a, a sign up, all Dallas Fort Worth airport is closed because of a snowstorm. All flights are canceled. So I called the people up, said, I'm sorry, I can't make it. It's a snowstorm. And they said, it's okay. And I went home very happily. Now, I was trying to get there, and I was glad not to do it. If my life depended on getting to Dallas Fort Worth, even if the airport was closed with the snowstorm, I would have gotten there. See? And yeah. that's, that's the difference between trying and doing. Now, if I have to kill someone to do, I might change. You know, I, I don't have to be so fixated that no matter what, I'm going to lose my morality or things like that. I can switch from one to the other. But it's important to realize which state you're in and not be frustrated in the trying state and stop doing it. It's, it's as simple as that. You know, uh, There's a funny story of, uh, we do a lot of exec ed trainings at, Stan, at, the, at the D school, and these three guys from some company took it together. And I have a little exercise where I have the participant try to take something away from me, and then they actually take something away from me. And they went back, they got an idea, and they went to the manager, and they said they'd like to do this little project. And he said, I'm sorry, we don't have any room, we don't have any physical room, you guys can't do that. So they huddled and they said, let's take it away from Bernie. 
<laughs> and they actually set up a little office in the hallway and they actually worked the project and eventually the manager relented and gave them space and they were very successful. In it. But this the whole idea, just because the manager said no, they weren't going to stop doing it. It's this whole idea of doing and not using bullshit reasons. Well, the manager said we can't do it, therefore we can't do it. So it all ties in what, what reasons and whether you're trying and doing. And they were just good to know that you have control of all of that. Yeah. No, yeah. I like, as I was listening to that, it sounds like the trying people have the mindset of they're fixed on like the, the meaning that's presented to them. Whereas the doers, they don't just see that they see other options as well. Yeah. They, they make it if they, you know, they, they want to, they want to do it as easily as the trying people do, but they're not fret. They're not stopped. They don't have a reason not to do it. It the reasons are both. They're going to do it no matter what, and they're going to transcend the the, the the obvious things that come in the way of doing it. And it's it's so magically, it's so empowering if you do it. But as I say, sometimes it's great to try. Sometimes you know it's better not to succeed. You might get killed if you succeed. So <laughs> it's right. a complicated thing. So I want to do two things. I want to rehabilitate trying. In spite of what Yoda said, trying is okay, but I think it's really important to realize trying is not the same as doing, and you get to choose, and you can switch from one to the other. Just don't kid yourself which state you're in. And you have this great section in the book that I found really beneficial was this idea of how we talk to ourselves can influence whether we're doers and triers. I mean, how do, how do doers talk to themselves, like that internal monologue we all have going on in our head? Yeah. Well, I think it's it, it's a kind of empower. We call it personal efficacy. This whole idea of having confidence in yourself, and the way you get it is by lots of little successes. You know, the people who want to train people to get rid of phobias, they give you little uh, guided exposures that are safe, and eventually you get to the pick up the snake or whatever you're afraid of. But the point simply is by learning little steps at a time you build this strength of, 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 of doing. And that's kind of what um, the magic of what we do in the D school. We, we, people are learning by doing. They're not learning by memorizing and passing tests. And if you learn by doing, it's really empowering. If you do something for someone, we do a lot of stuff and people earn less than $2 a day all over the world. If you go and you're in a hut of some farmers in, uh, in Myanmar and you can help these people have uh, task lighting or something like that, it's so inspiring, it's so powering for the rest of your life that you've done these things. It, it gives you confidence to go on. And that's what life is about, having confidence to do more and more things and having successes in it and learning from your failures. And so it's it's a kind of doing existence that we have. And, uh, you know, if you just lay in bed all day and you think about your problems, nothing's going to happen. Most of us have like, I don't know, 80,000 or 60,000 thoughts a day. And uh, 80% of them are repeated thoughts <laughs> if you haven't figured it out by the, the third day get out of bed it's not going to happen you got to go and do something so that's the really the point of it is to start to do and that leads to more doing and uh, i know in my life you know when i was a teenager i was uh, you know i was not capable of doing many things I, I lived a kind of not directed life and as i got more involved and had some successes academically they built on it and built on it and uh, you know, before I knew it, I was the world's expert in something. But I didn't get there by being born with it. I got there by doing lots of things and putting them all together. So it's really just this uh, learning by doing is a very powerful tool. Okay. And that's that's the achievement habit. Like it, you do this so often that it becomes just second nature to you. Yeah, yeah. You just it just becomes who you are. You, you change. You know, nobody's brain <clears throat> is fixed for life. Your brain is a very malleable thing. And by doing stuff, you make different connections and you with your synapses and stuff, and you remodel your brain. We've done tests where we put people into little simple kind of creativity problem workshop, just very short for an hour or two. And we do that for a couple of weeks, and we put them in an MRI machine before we put them in an MRI machine afterward, and we find the part of your brain which does the creativity has changed because of these simple exercises. I mean, it's really, it's so hard to imagine, but it is, and the change more stays for a long time. So anything you do changes who you are. So it's this whole idea of changing the way you want to go. 
And you can change in a bit. You know, there's, there's addiction, the people that's really hard to get rid of if once your brain is changed that way. But there's other, other ways of you can get addicted to good things also. You don't have to get addicted to bad things, although addiction is not great no matter how you have it. But basically, it's a matter of using the experience. So there are manual things of learning. And, uh, you know, it's, it's even funny if you take people who are the world's greatest musician and something, these people are practicing all the time. You know, uh, Heifetz is practicing. All, all these people who are world-renowned, <clears throat> they're, not, <clears throat> they're not sitting around uh, dawdling all day long. They're practicing, they're practicing, they're practicing. They're pra athletes, the same way, you know, they're, they're practicing. So it's the same thing in anything in life. If you want to have good skills and you want to go on, you have to keep doing it. And as you keep doing it, you reinforce that part of your brain or, or your musculature that lets you do it. And so you build on your successes. I love it. Well, Bernie, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about your work in the book? Well, the book is the, the book is available <laughs> all over the place in the libraries, and you can buy it if you want to. Uh, it's called The Achievement Habit. It's published by HarperCollins. And I have a website, though, where uh, you can see various lectures I've given at different companies. And, and it's, it's the name of the book, except without the the. So it's achievementhabit.com, and you can get more of me than you ever would want there and <laughs> learn more about the book. Well, Bernie Roth, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, too. My guest today was Bernie Roth. He's the author of the book, The Achievement Habit. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash achievement habit, where you find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. And if you're looking to develop the achievement habit and get unstuck out of a rut, check out our online platform, The Strenuous Life at strenuouslife.co. Basically, it's a scouting program for grown men. I know it might sound kind of silly, but it's worked. Over 3,000 guys have signed up, developed new habits in fitness. They're learning new skills. It's really been a kick in the pants for a lot of guys. So for more information, check out strenuouslife.co. 